and welcome to Making It Work. My name is Allison McCann, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development for the Portland Press Herald and the Masthead Main Media Network. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today, and I'd like to give special appreciation to our Making It Work sponsors, many of whom have supported our business events year after year. They are Cross Insurance, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, Katahdin Trust Company, and Menic. And now I'd like to introduce the Senior Vice President of External Affairs at Menic, Tony Payne. Tony? Thank you, Allison, and welcome everybody. This uh, is a, an ongoing valuable series. And as we were discussing before we came on to the, uh, to the uh, cast, uh, already a lot of questions have been sent in. So it tells us that the opinions and expertise is highly valued. Memic is a, uh, the state's largest workers' compensation carrier, as you may know. We insure over 22,000 employ employers from Maine to uh, Florida and approximately 300,000 workers at those places of employment. So for them, uh, this topic is very clearly of interest and of importance because time off is something that is valued by everyone, but the question is, can you afford to do it? So one of the things that we, uh, we do wanna sneak in here before winter is over is be, please be very careful about your foot, footing as we're not quite out of snow and ice season. Slips, trips and falls, the number, uh, number three cause for lost time from work. And we wanna make sure everybody stays safe. So get yourself a pair of cleats, sand, shovel, and salt. Thank you and, and thank you for the Press Herald for putting on this series. Thank you, Tony. And thank you for the, for the good reminder. We're, we're not out of the woods yet for the winter. So um, now I'd like to hand things over to today's host, our special projects editor, Carol Coltis. Carol? Thank you. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, Tony. And thank you, folks, for joining us today. Um, you know, I don't know if I was distracted by the events in Washington for the month of January, or I was preoccupied with tracking COVID among family and friends, but this new law really snuck up on me. And so when I began to try to play catch up, I realized that this new law has the potential to impact pretty much every business in the state. And, um, and so just, you know, very quickly, the, the state's new earned paid leave requires for every worker, uh, whether they're full-time, part-time, per diem, and intern, um, for every 40 hours they work, they're able to bank one hour of earned paid leave up to 40 hours for the calendar year. And that means, that if they are presented with an emergency, and of course, I immediately remembered when pipes burst in my kid's daycare and it was closed, or another time I was driving and I heard that, or didn't, didn't hear, but I felt that dreadful slip in my transmission and realized, oh God, I'm gonna break down on the side of the road. That for, for situations like that, this new law will, uh, would allow the worker to be paid for the time that they are missed and for there to be no retribution for taking time um, when there's no opportunity for, for planning or for, uh, for uh, coordinating with a supervisor. So that was the intent behind the law. Maine is the first uh, state in the country to adopt this, this kind of earned paid leave. And so as a consequence, there is a lot of confusion um, how, uh, around how it is to be implemented. It became effective on, on January 1st this year. So to help us kind of unravel that, we have two terrific experts um, joining us. And um, I'm going to introduce them in just a moment, uh, but, I, but I'm gonna let you know that we're gonna try to put a little extra time for the Q&A format um, portion of today's segment because we broke records with the numbers of questions that were submitted when people registered for this event. So clearly it's an issue that people are concerned about and are trying to educate themselves. And it's also a complicated law. So I would advise folks um, just in general, uh, you might wanna check with whomever your trusted business advisor is uh, to make sure that your policies are in compliance with the new law uh, because there are, it's complicated and there are some vagaries and 
our intent today is to give you an overview and hit some of the, the big broad swath questions, um, but you might wanna, you might wanna follow up uh, for your own personal circumstance. So joining us today, I'm delighted, is uh, Cynthia Murphy. She is a senior program director at a CEI's workforce uh, program. Cynthia has been a panelist with us before and she leads the workforce solution strategy and program delivery at CEI with a real focus on helping employers uh, create strategies that deliver a competitive advantage and also opens up job opportunities. Um, she is also a big advocate for public policies that encourage quality jobs and amplify uh, the public narrative around how jobs, good jobs, um, will strengthen families, businesses, and communities. Before she joined CEI, Cynthia had a 25 plus year career in the for-profit sector, leading commercial operations for subsidiaries of Thomson Reuters. Um, and she holds a BA from the University of Maine and a master's degree from Simmons College. And she has credentials from Georgetown University in nonprofit management. So we have Cynthia with us today, and we also have Tawny Alvarez. So Tawny is a partner at Verrill, Verrill, not Verrill Dana, everyone. And um, she's an employment law specialist there. She serves as the editor of Verrill's Employment and Labor Group blog, and she regularly presents to employers and human resource professionals on trending issues and best practices, uh, specifically around um, employment law. So she also created the HR Law 101 series uh, to provide individuals who are new to, to human resources with guidance on best practices. She holds a law degree from Pace University and an undergraduate degree from Thomas College. So I'm really delighted that we have uh, both of these super capable women joining us today. And, um, and I'm gonna get the ball rolling uh, by tossing the first question to you, Tawny. Um, and, and basically because of the confusion around this new law and who must comply with it, um, what does it mean for uh, existing vacation or sick leave policies? Um, are people exempt if they already have those on the books? I, I'm just wondering if you can just sort of set us straight on who does this new law um, affect? So take it away. Absolutely, thank you so much, Carol. The tough part is, is that you're going to get that horrible lawyer answer, which is maybe, <laughs> right? So if you currently have a leave policy in place, it may um, be sufficient in order to meet the minimum requirements of Maine's earned paid leave statute. Um, when we're talking about this um, issue, the statute, we're looking at employers who have uh, 11 or more employees within the state of Maine, right? And that's based off of who you're paying unemployment for. So that's generally a good way to look at it. So you're an employer in the state of Maine, you have 11 or more employees within the state. Um, you need to provide 40 hours of paid leave to, to your employees during the course of the year. That's all of your employees. That's your per diem employees who maybe only work uh, four hours a year or only a couple weeks a year, right? But for every 40 hours that those individuals work, they have to earn at least one hour of earned paid leave with a maximum of 40 hours total. Um, you can have requirements in place specifically with regards to uh, it can't be used within the first 120 days of employment, or you must give notice unless it's an emergency or, or your car transmit your transmission slips or something along those lines. So there are different reasons in which that type of notice might not be required. You have to permit employees to take it for any reason at all. Um, mental health, child is sick, parents are ill, um, vacation, and any reason at all it is a sufficient reason under Maine's earned paid leave statute, which is something that differentiates it from many of the statutes throughout the country. And then, and we'll probably get into this a little later, Carol, but in most situations, um, your current or an employer's current vacation or leave policy will not meet the criteria 
that's set forth by the state based off of how pay is, is done for this time. So for your hourly employees, we're using a mixture. It's not just their hourly rate that they're gonna be paid for the time that they take off, but you're gonna determine a base rate of pay based off of the previous week's pay, which is going to take into account bonuses, commissions, other additional payments outside of their hourly rate. And I haven't seen any um, employee vacation, sick leave, PTO policy that is um, accruing leave or permitting people to take it in that format. So that becomes another operational difficulty for those who already have a policy, but that's not in compliance with Maine's new statute. Wow. So there's, there's plenty to unpack there. Go ahead, Cynthia. <laughs> yeah, that was great, Tony. Thanks so much. I think, um, I think, you know, we hit on all the important points here. I think that what we're seeing from the business implementation standpoint is folks who have that existing policy that say, hey, I think I'm good. You know, I have, um, I offer a week of vacation time. I offer a week of sick time. So I'm good. So I think the biggest thing to really look at here, as Tawny and Carol both said, is that under this new law, if the leave has been accrued, so someone's earned the leave, they can take it for any reason whatsoever. And the employer um, cannot require notice if it's an emergency, if it's something that's unforeseen. So in the examples that, that Tani gave, so your car breaks down, you've got a childcare issue, or you're sick yourself, or you've got a, a sick family member, um, you simply need to give notice um, as soon as is practical. And so I think that's the area, Tony, that we're seeing where um, we have, have the most questions. Is that what you're seeing as well? Yes, no, I mean, the, the interrelationship between um, current leave practices or policies and how this new statute affects it. Honestly, for those who weren't providing any leave before the statute took effect, it, it becomes a lot easier to craft something or if the employer and company is like, we're gonna scrap our current policy and start from scratch. It's really marrying the concept of what they're currently providing and what their employees expect with complying with the, the law. One of the points I think that you made, um, Tani, that I think is really worth um, reinforcing for business owners who are, who are looking for some kind of protection is that you are able to craft a policy that restricts use until a new employee has been working for 120 calendar days. So the new employee will be accruing leave, but if you put a written policy in place indicating that they can't use it until after they cross the 120 calendar day mark, that does give the business owner some protection. It does, and then the employer can decide, I mean, this is paid leave. So at the end, let's say the individual doesn't make it 120 days, the employer can have policies in place as to whether at the termination of employment, any earned but unused earned paid leave will be paid out, or is it forfeited if it's not used when, when the employee terminates, whether by their own accord or by the employer's accord. One of the other areas that um, a business owner may want to consider when they're crafting their policy to comply with this new law is the, um, the uh, increments in which someone can take earned paid leave. And you are allowed to have a minimum of one hour increments. So in other words, if you have an em employee who um, his car breaks down and they're 15 minutes late for work, um, if you've got a written policy in place that stipulates that the leave is taken in one hour increments, then that 15 minute period would not be covered. And this becomes, I mean, this becomes a really interesting question because depending on your industry, a lot of industries previously said you have to take a whole day off or you have to take half a day because if you're not here when the shift starts, we have to bring someone in to start the shift because we can't operate unless everyone um, is present and accounted for. There's a person standing in each of these spots. Um, under the, the statute, employees, 
permissively can take one hour of leave. They, they can't be required to take four or eight hours of leave or, or multiple days in a row of, of leave. The other area that um, employers can consider when they're looking at policies to comply with the law is around um, peak periods. So if you are a retail business and you normally do a huge amount of business on Black Friday, you can restrict planned earned paid leave on Black Friday. Or let's take the example of the production environment that Tani was just referring to. Um, if you've got peak periods of production, you can restrict the number of people or, or other use during those, those peak periods. But again, you've got to have a written policy to that. Exactly. And it's interesting because um, everyone jokes that I'm always kind of that dark cloud that comes into the room saying all the risks and all the bad things that are going to happen. And of course, now so many of my clients think like that as well. And they say to me, but Tani, what happens if we deny leave that someone's trying to take, but then on the morning of they call in and say they're sick or their kid's sick or something like that. Can we require a doctor's note? The answer is no. No, we cannot require a doctor's note unless we have three consecutive absences in a row. Um, if there's another policy in effect, and this becomes the really tough part of, of the law right now, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, we're not a live panel right now for a lot of reasons, but <laughs> if somebody is saying, I was sick yesterday, in a lot of situations, an employer's COVID-19 policies are gonna say, okay, well, we need a doctor's note or we need some documentation that's going to say if you had any of these symptoms that you're permitted to return to work or anything like that. So under the earned paid leave statute, we can't ask for anything about the health of the person or their family member. Um, but during the pandemic, if there's a potential other policy that would require it, um, for safety and health reasons, I, I would suggest that a policy is in place to provide that you can request a doctor's note in those situations. I'm glad you brought up our, um, um, COVID-19 and the pandemic uh, and the tie to um, earn paid leave, Tani. I was wondering, um, do you get a lot of questions from businesses about um, how this relates to some of the federal legislation that was passed right after the pandemic. So with the Families First Act and the emergency sick leave and emergency family leave. Yeah, I mean, for a lot of, um, for a lot of my clients who had smaller workforces, by the time we get to December 31st, a lot of those employers, their employees had already used all available time under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So then moving into January 1st of 2021 through March 31st of 2021, a lot of employees didn't have available leave. But employers need to recall and that the Family First Coronavirus Response Act was extended in, in some formats. You're not required to provide. Um, those 40 hours or two weeks of leave for, for six very specific COVID related reasons, but you could. And in those situations, remember you're gonna get a tax break. So using and, and using that FFCRA leave oftentimes makes more business sense for an organization and not requiring employees to use available earned paid leave at that point in time. Come March 31st, you know, then we're only gonna be looking at the earned paid leave um, available. But for some of our larger employers, one of the confusing parts has been how all of this interrelates with Family Medical Leave Act, if it's your own health condition. So consider when someone is using earned paid leave, but it's for their own health condition, there's a lot of other statutes still at play. Um, the Family Medical Leave Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, all of these other leave statutes, potentially workers with Tony, um, Tony workers comp could be an issue too, right? You still have to continue to uh, consider all these available leaves, even if the employee is taking earned paid. So Tony, who makes that decision? Is it the, empl the employee saying, I want to activate my earned paid leave option? Or is it the employer saying, your situation uh, falls under this provision? Like, how, how do you make that decision? Yeah, I would suggest that the employer identify that for the employee and say, 
your leave is qualifying for Families First Coronavirus Response Act, you still have available time. My suggestion would be is that you use that bank of time down before you jump into your earned paid leave. But if they, for some reason, are saying, no, I want this to be my earned paid leave, this is what I want, then the employee or would not be able to take um, the tax credit for the time and would need to, to use it as the employee has directed. And that's one of the big aspects of it is the employee can use the time at their discretion for what they want with certain boundaries, but the FFCRA would not be one of those parameters. Mm -hmm. So what is really great about the FFCRA, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, is the, the tax credit for the business owner. The business owner is, um, is reimbursed for two thirds of the pay. And they get that immediately um, when they do their quarterly employment tax filings. So from your, you know, you both work with a lot of business clients. What have been the pressing issues from, from, from their point of view? Is it, is it a matter of going through all of existing policies and trying to adjust them for this new benefit? Or is it a matter of looking at their operations and trying to figure out how to, you know, what, what you were um, saying, Cynthia, if you're on a production line and you can't start until you have a certain number of workers, how do you plan for that if someone says, oh, I am, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not gonna be there for two hours or they just don't show up and say two hours into the shift, I had to take my earned paid leave because I had car trouble. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'll go first and then Tony can kind of jump in and fill in the blanks. The uh, uh, employers are, are struggling with, um, in some cases, creating a policy, right? And so Tony said, it's a little bit easier because you kind of can get out the rules and kind of go step by step and, and create your policy and communicate it out. Um, for businesses with existing policies, the biggest challenges that we're seeing is um, accommodating this for any reason right. aspect of the law that you can take it for any reason. And the um, if it's an emergency, the notice period, which is as soon as practical. So that's creating issues in the production line example, or also if you think about a highly regulated field like childcare, where the state requires a certain number of uh, teachers to children, and if a child care teacher is, is sick and, and unable to come and, and there's a very short window to try to find a substitute, it creates a lot, of, a lot of challenges. And so business owners are really grappling with those operational issues. Um, how do they create some slack in their organization where someone could fill in that um, position on the line or step into a classroom in a, in a child care? So it's, um, it's, uh, it requires some, some forethought and planning. Absolutely. So I'll echo everything that Cynthia just said, and, and I'll also add to it. I mean, there's also um, some employees have misinformation or they had a belief that they were going to get an extra 40 hours. So employers who are already offering three weeks of paid time away from work in some format, maybe it was two weeks vacation, one week sick leave, those types of paid leave that was already in place, there were a lot of employees who expected they were gonna get an additional 40 hours and communicating the change in policy expectations um, to employees has also been something from an operational standpoint that has been difficult. Um, additionally, I've talked to some large employers who when we've updated and changed the policies internally, their payroll provider may be out of state and maybe not 100% up to date on, on what the new statute requires, what the rules say, and their ability to, and this is all the back end computer stuff that I know nothing about, but to get payroll to do what they need it to do and specifically to figure out the base rate of pay as to how this earned paid leave should be paid out has also been very tricky for a lot of employers. And any employer that had a disciplinary procedure in their policy handbook really needs to take a, an, another look at that because under the terms of this law, uh, an employee cannot be disciplined for taking earned paid leave that they have accrued. If, if you're a company that uh, uses a payroll service, have they been, are, are they up to date? Are they, for instance, Tani, you mentioned this is how you figure out what uh, 
what the rate of pay is if someone is taking earned paid leave. But what about just tracking those hours? I mean, are the payroll companies doing that? Or is there going to be another category on the spreadsheet that says by employee, this much earned paid leave has been accrued? Or is that going to be left up to the individual business operators? So uh, it really depends on the organization and how, how they operate. So I've worked with a lot of clients who will do a referral bonus of some format, right? And it may not go through pay, it may not go through payroll. They might have different systems that are in play so that once a month, everyone gets a referral bonus if they've you know, done X, Y, or Z, or if there's a production bonus in some format. So sometimes it's Mary, it's getting your payroll provider program to speak to any bonus or commission structure program that you have in place. If your payroll provider already is keeping track of that, I, I do note that they have been good of keeping on top of the Department of Labor. Um, Department of Labor has been great with updating their frequently asked questions throughout the course of this process, you know, September, October, November, December, January, we've gotten updated frequently asked questions uh, every single month as more questions are coming in. Um, attorneys throughout the state are, um, you know, constantly going to Department of Labor. And I actually have a group of other attorneys at, at other local firms where we'll throw around questions and say, have you thought about this? Or what's your response to this? Or has anyone talked to Department of Labor to see their thoughts on this? Um, so I laugh, but it's definitely brought local attorneys together <laughs> as we try to figure it out. <laughs> And, and what about that whole law of unintended consequences, you know, given that we're the first state in the nation to do this, and that you have groups like yours, Tawny, of lawyers trying to figure out in this scenario, this is possible, in that scenario, this is possible. I mean, I, I, I know it's only been a, not quite a couple of months, but have there been issues that have percolated to the surface of and that people go, oh, we didn't think of that, so. Yeah, there were, there's been amendments and updates to, especially like the base rate of pay. So in some situations we are hourly anesthesiologists potentially, right? Who are making hundreds of thousand dollars a, a year based off of how they work. And then trying to figure out what their base rate of pay would be in a week where they, you know, got all these other payments based off of shift differentials or those type of things. Um, and we went to the Department of Labor and, you know, we gave some of these scenarios saying, is this what you intended for, you know, us to be paying somebody for, it's not, and it's much more than four times the minimum wage. I mean, this was created with kind of, I don't want to say minimum wage earners at top of mind, but people who are balancing multiple jobs. So retail, hospitality, who maybe are working 20 hours for one entity and 30 hours for another, who based off of those hours of work had no paid leave previously. That was who we're, who I think this law was directed towards, but it, it encompasses and, and touches on everyone, exempt and non-exempt employees, professionals, blue collar, you know, all over the map. So there has been unintended consequences that the Department of Labor, I think, has done a really great job of responding to. I would echo that. I would say the Department of Labor has just been amazing. I mean, from the countless public hearings they had and responding to everyone who came forward, employees, business owners, I think they did an excellent job of not only putting together the rules, but the FAQs, which as Tony said, have been updated multiple times. Um, I would say that um, one of the really interesting things that um, we've seen arise is with businesses that are smaller than are required to adhere to the law. So those with 10 and fewer, um, we've, we've worked with many of those businesses who were thinking, huh, you know, it might be different and difficult for us to attract and retain employees if someone can go down the street to a slightly larger employer who is required to provide earned paid leave. And so we've been working with those business owners to craft um, paid leave policies that meet the needs of their business that don't necessarily um, uh, tie to this law. And so we've gotten really creative where if, they, if it's a, a business that's cyclical in nature, 
maybe during a down month or two, that's when they'll, they'll um, give their employees uh, paid time off. And so that's been a really interesting unintended consequence. I think as, as Tani said, the, one of the ideas behind this law was to provide people who have multiple jobs or people who are um, coming into the workforce or immigrants or people who are earning a, a relatively low wage to give them the opportunity to recuperate if they're not feeling well and not have to make that decision between being paid and getting better. And so it is nice to see that kind of trickle down to smaller businesses, but creating policies that work for the business and help the business stay competitive. Yeah, and just to kind of add on to what, what Cynthia mentioned, I mean, when we're talking about other unintended consequences, manufacturing is one that it has been more difficult um, to institute. And a lot of people might be scratching their heads saying like, well, that's a lot, that's a lot of people. What, what do you mean by that? A lot of manufacturers have shutdown periods where um, they've already been providing some type of paid vacation, but they have ingrained in their employees to save that vacation PTO for a shutdown period. So, hey, you, you get your two weeks of vacation, use it for the two shutdown weeks that we have, one in June and one in November. Under the earned paid leave statute, you can't require that an employee use uh, earned paid leave on a date in which you're not operating. So it could be that office people um, are still working during the shutdown, but your people on the floor aren't. You couldn't require that they use earned paid leave during that shutdown. So they then would get maybe a week of, of unpaid time during one of the shutdowns and they choose to take a vacation outside of the manufacturing shutdown dates, which then, as Cynthia had mentioned before, from a scheduling perspective can get difficult. Since you mentioned some businesses and their cyclical nature, and I know we got a couple of questions about this in advance, how is this, how is this going to affect seasonal workforces, seasonal businesses? I'll jump on Cynthia and then how about you? You fill in the, in the blanks. That's another place where I don't want to say it's been misinformation, but that it's been very confusing for um, employers and employees because there's this reference to seasonal employees within the, within the rules and within the frequently asked questions. So a lot of entities that aren't seasonal in nature, but may bring on a, a bigger staff during the holidays, or if it's the ski resorts for during the winter months or on the coast during the summer, thinking, okay, this doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply to any of my seasonal workforce, so it doesn't apply to me. The seasonality, employ the seasonal employer definition is based off of unemployment rules you are only going to be a seasonal employer if you already were a seasonal employer. So people who are able to take advantage of the seasonality exception to the earned paid leave statute already would have been registered as a seasonal employer generally with the unemployment department prior to this law taking effect. It could be that they never registered in that way and you could now, but there's very specific rules they have to be met and it includes looking at your revenue cycle. It includes looking at your employee base. There's a lot of standards that must be met. So just having a seasonal group of employees in and of itself likely isn't going to be sufficient to exempt you from these rules. Yeah, that's right. Um, we can put in the chat the, um, the, the link to the list of seasonal industries. But it goes beyond that, as Tani was saying, that you have to already have been registered with the Bureau of Unemployment Compensation. Not to say that couldn't be done today, but that's, that's the starting point. Also, um, if you are a business owner who has seasonal workers, I encourage you to take a look at the FAQs. There are quite a few detailed frequently asked questions about specific kinds of, of seasonal workers. And you may find your specific um, scenario mentioned there. So one of the uh, one of the other questions that that was submitted um, ahead of time um, has to do about has to do with consequences. So what happens? What's the enforcement action on this? What happens if you do not comply with this new law? 
So if the Department of Labor learns of, or there's a report to the Department of Labor and or in an audit, the Department of Labor uh, determines that you are not in compliance with the statute, you're looking at a $1,000 forfeiture um, per employee per offense. So you're gonna take, I mean, it's five days or five, and this becomes interesting. So are they gonna look at it as hours or days? So you could have up to 40 offenses maybe per, per, per employee. Um, so if somebody requested one hour of paid leave and didn't receive it, and kept requesting those hours of, of paid leave and didn't receive it, you could have up to 40 violations per employee per year at up to $1,000 forfeiture um, per incident with the Department of Labor. Now, there's not a, a personal cause of action, so an individual employee cause of action related to the statute currently. Um, it's just Department of Labor Enforcement. Good. So I'm gonna switch to the to the question format in just a minute, but before I do, is there any other big aspect of this new law that we haven't touched on before we get to, to taking questions from the audience? I open that up to, to both of you. You know, one thing I, I um, I'm not sure if we, hit on um, is uh, we've talked a lot about emergency leave and uh, you know something comes up at the last minute and, and an employee needs to take some time off. Um, so people can plan leave too, right? <laughs> as, as part of this, this law. And so business owners can implement a policy that requires up to four weeks notice for planned leave. And that's something that we encourage business owners to think about. If they'd like that notice for planned leave, go ahead and write that, document that in a policy. Uh, anything up to four weeks is permitted. And, and then when, I'll, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, so what's an example of a planned leave? Like, it, it, can- Vacation. Okay, just, just um, in, for a company that doesn't have a vacation policy, you can use earned paid leave to take vacation? Sure, you can use it if you know you're going to the doctor in, um, if you, you, know, you know you're going to the doctor in three weeks, that would be a planned, you know, hour or two hours or four hours or whatever it is. Um, if you're planning to go away for a long weekend and you want Friday or Monday, that would, be, so earned paid leave is literally for anything, um, including planned leave. And uh, so uh, if a business owner does um, want to require notice for that, the law allows them to ask for up to four weeks. Okay. So that does help a bit when you're thinking about being on that um, manufacturing floor. Another question that I've seen um, from employers recently, or one of the reasons why I think a lot of employers weren't looking at this is they say, we have a unionized workforce, so my collective bargaining agreement is, is what rules I don't need to consider or think about this. Uh, it's partially correct. Um, if you have a collective bargaining agreement that was in effect as of January 1st of 2021, uh, you don't have to amend or update your current um, agreement, your current CBA, but when it expires, you're going to have to make sure you provide benefits that are equal to or in excess of what's required under the earned paid leave statute. So even if you're maybe not worried about instituting right now, you need to be prepared to come to the table knowing that that's going to be your floor um, when previously your floor had either been with the last um, bargain for time off had been or, or nothing. Great. Well, let's go ahead and start taking some questions from the audience. Strawberry, can you tee up the first one, please? Yes. Um, if someone leaves your company, do you owe them accrued time? That you touched on that. <laughs> That depends. Um, you can have a policy in place that dictates how you operate. So first, I think Cynthia would agree with me. We both highly recommend having a written policy in place. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is your written policy, policy should describe how you would respond in that situation. Will you pay out um, the earned but unused, earned paid leave at the termination of employment, or you won't. You can choose that. 
If you don't have a policy or your policy is silent as to this factor, then they're going to look at what your vacation policy is. So however you treat vacation time, they're gonna treat earned paid leave similar or this not even, not similar, the same. Great. Next. Uh, yep, does go ahead. the law treat exempt and non-exempt employees differently? Yes and no. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, I pr I'm pretty sure that I could just sit up here and say maybe yes and no for the rest of the presentation. Um, in certain aspects, it does treat them differently and in certain ways it treats the same. That um, analogy, the description I was giving of how to determine what the base rate of pay were is, is for your non-exempt employees. Your exempt employees, one hour of earned paid leave is gonna be determined by what is the weekly salary of this individual divided by 40. That is what one hour of earned paid leave is going to be paid out at. So it's easy from that standpoint. Additionally, for your exempt employees, even if I work 80 hours a week, every week, I only earned one hour of earned paid leave that week. So it's presumed that an exempt employee is only working 40 hours a week. Cynthia, did I miss anything there? Because I think there could be a couple other tiny nuances between the two, but those I are the I think you got it. You got okay. it. <laughs> Good, next question. Great, uh, can we state that interns must work 120 hours before they are eligible for earned time off, but not have this requirement for regular employees? Oh, that's a good question. No, there's my first, <laughs> yes, no, maybe, no. This one's a straight no. Um, so for your, um, your, sorry, interns, for your interns who are coming in, they start earning earned paid leave on the first day of work, right? You can restrict them from using it after 120 days, but not 120 hours and not 120 um, worked days. Um, so it would be tough or it would be high risk to then take different categories of employees and say exempt employees can begin to use accrued um, earn paid leave as soon as they accrue it, but non-exempt or, or temporary or intern employees have to wait 120 days. Arguably, you could have that restriction in place. Department of Labor says that you can require 120 days before they're used, but if you're segmenting your population, I believe that you run into concerns that potentially could result in some type of discrimination based claim depending on how your workforce is made up whether it's race gender age um, it really is going to depend on the workforce and just having that one consistent policy it's so much simpler operationally so practical and legal advice yeah. there very, very good Next what question. If company, what if your company dips or rises below 11 employees? Do you continue to count time when the amount of employees dips below 11? Getting those real technical questions now. Um, okay, so you determine how many employees you have based off of review of the previous 120 days in a calendar year. So you look at the last 120 days and determine whether in the usual and regular course of business, you employed 11 employees or more during that period of time. If in the pre previous 120 days you didn't, then you wouldn't be a covered employer. The problem here, and I'm gonna turn it over to Cynthia, actually I'm gonna have her tell you what the problem is <laughs> when we are really juggling the line between being a covered employer and not being a covered employer. Well, what I actually was going to do first is, is give a bit of a tip. So um, Tani may not actually like this tip uh, because it's kind of a rough order of magnitude, but not being the lawyer, I guess I can say it. So what I, I think the first thing to do is to look at your quarterly filings to the Bureau of Unemployment Compensation. It's a quick way of looking to see whether you... Um, 
uh, are required to comply. I don't know. That's my, that's kind of my, my answer on this. So the pro so, and I think Cynthia's solution to figure out whether or not you have to comply is important, but the problem becomes is quarter one, you have to comply quarter two, you don't. What are you going to do in quarter two with the people who earned the time last quarter? last quarter, but now you don't have to provide it. I think there becomes a communication breakdown and some cultural ish. And I say cultural from an organization culture perspective that you're going to have some very, and I'm going to use a really harsh term, irate, um, irate employees if you're jumping back and forth between these two. Um, so if at all financially feasible, um, when you're, you've dropped below that covered employee, I would recommend maintaining provision of the earned paid leave. You bring up such a good point, Tani. You know, um, this is a state law, but the employee is highly likely to see this as somewhat discretionary um, on the part of the employer. And if you think about it, in most of our businesses, it's our people that make the difference. It's our people that provide us with competitive advantage and make the business tick. And so um, I think trying to maintain uh, a few uh, fewer irate employees <laughs> um, <laughs> is, is the recommendation. Let me, uh, let me hop in here because one of the questions that we got uh, when folks registered and, and I think has, has come up again is what happens if you have employees through a third party, through an agency, if you've got, you know, some of your workers are with Kelly Services for, are provided by Kelly Services, for instance, are those folks covered by your company's earned paid leave policy as well? So the, the, it's important, and this is one of those very technical aspects, but very important still. When you're bringing in someone from Kelly Staffing, those are independent contractors, right? They're not your employees. Right. You are only responsible providing earned paid leave to your employees. Kelly Staffing would be required to provide earned paid leave to the contractors that they are sending to your um, organization. At the same time, though, you need to recall that if an employee of Kelly Staffing who's providing services to you calls out to Kelly Staffing, they're also calling out to you. So from an operational standpoint, you need to be prepared for that. But from an uh, institution of policy perspective, you don't have to be focusing on whether or not the leave's being provided to these independent contractors. And of course, this is when the attorney gives the caveat. Um, there is a caveat in the rules concerning if you are in the construction industry and you're a member of a multi-employer bargaining unit. So that covers a very small group of people, but there does become a discussion about contractors and subcontractors and whether you become an employer when you're a multi-employer bargaining unit. Um, but from a Kelly staffing perspective, or and I don't mean to, that's a, I think that's the one that's given in the, in the request or the example. From a staffing agency perspective, the staffing agency needs to provide the earned paid leave, not the contract company. Great, thank you. Okay, Strawberry, next up. Uh, if you offer more than 40 hours of PTO, do you have to treat all PTO under the terms of Maine's law? No. Yay, I gave like a helpful answer. I feel like for the first time today, I gave a helpful answer. No. So you don't have to, if you provide 120, 80 hours, they don't all have to comply. Just 40 hours of it have to comply. I recommend saying the first 40 hours just to make it operationally easier. Cynthia, you might have some experience as to other ways operationally people have been able to um, create a, a more... Um, an easier way for, for this to come about. I think what you recommended is absolutely the easiest way to do it. Make it the first 40. Great. Um, are there places that employers can go for help drafting their policies, a resource with the language that either should or should be or is required in a policy? 
I haven't actually seen a resource. Have you, Tony? No, no, because I put myself out of business in part. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. <that's what> I <laughs> thought. Yeah, no, I mean, you've got um, HR consult, you've got HR consultants who, who will do it. Um, free resources that I'm aware of, no. The main Department of Labor in the links that have been posted um, in the chat provide you with all the elements that need to be there, which you can then um, you can then mold into what fits within your organization's culture. So all the primary elements that are there, and you could then ask an HR consultant or ask your um, HR um, counsel to take a quick look at it. Um, Cynthia, I know you're working with a ton of entities that are engaged with CEI. So I think Cynthia, if, you're, if people aren't already involved with CEI, that that also becomes a great resource. Yeah, there are really only uh, five or six areas of discretion, quite frankly, that a business owner has when they're looking at their policies. We've we've touched on those today, so I'll just you know highlight some of them. It's the um, restricting use until 120 calendar days after the job start, um, restricting use during defined uh, work periods, uh, peak periods of work, uh, the Black Friday example, or production periods. Um, the, the one hour increments, right? That, that's an area where you can uh, set that threshold. Um, the four, up to four weeks notice for the uh, planned leave and then what you do at the end of employment. Those are about the only areas I think, Tony, that I can come up with that are discretionary. Um, so that's the minimum I think you'd wanna put in your, in your policy. And, and you have to watch what you say about discipline. I would agree. And you know what, Cynthia, I just realized as you were talking about the discretionary stuff, I realized that there's a requirement that neither of us have mentioned 51 uh -oh. minutes into this. There is a posting requirement for this law. So no matter what, right, even if you think Cynthia and I, you know, if you're just going to go and read whatever the Department of Labor has put out there, you're also going to need to download a new labor law poster to hang up in your work environment. And for those who only have employees who are working remotely, you need to still share that with your employees or post on any remote workspace. So that is a requirement. It's not a recommendation. Um, so everyone, if you haven't done that prior to today, I highly recommend that being a really good first step to get the ball moving on this. And I think we gave um, Strawberry the link to that just ahead of this, so she'll post that with the resources. Yep, I just popped it into the chat. Our, oh, thank you. Uh, our next question is, um, is this new law used in conjunction with MFSL or is one used then the other when the first one runs out? Can you give the acronym again, um, Strawberry, sorry. It's Main Family Sick Leave. Okay, this is great, great question. Um, that depends. So it, we have this, okay, so we have FML, we have federal FMLA, we have Maine Family Medical Leave Act, if you have 15 or more employees, and then we have Maine, so Maine Sick Leave Statute. Um, the Maine Sick Leave Statute is going to allow individuals to take leave to care for a sick family member. So right now the Department of Labor is indicating that if you're first, if you provide more than 40 hours of leave to your team members, to your employees, and your employee uses the first 40 hours of leave for something that doesn't qualify under the main family sick leave statute. So let's say they go to Palm Springs for 40 hours, but the individual has other remaining paid time off, you would have to permit the individual to use that time for caring for a family member who is ill or sick. That is not set forth anywhere on the frequently asked questions or on the regulations. That is my understanding at this point in time as to how the Department of Labor views um, the rule views kind of the institution of the policy. At the same time, however, if you or a family member had a health condition that qualifies for main family medical leave or federal family medical leave, 
the earned paid leave and family medical leave would run concurrently at the same time. So when you take your 40 hours of earned paid leave, you're also taking 40 hours of your main family medical leave, which as you're all aware is up to 10 weeks in a two year period if you have 15 or more employees. There was a lot there, so I apologize, but there were also a lot of different statutes that are in effect. This is one, this is a question that I would highly recommend you contact your, your labor or employment council um, because it is something that remains unclear. Um, we offer a paid leave that can be used for any reason, but it is prorated for part-time employees. Under the act, someone working 32 hours a week can earn 40 hours, correct? Someone working 32 hours a week can earn 40 hours, but they just would earn it. It would take them longer to earn it than it would someone who works 40 hours a week. So when you do the math out, if you work 40 hours a week, every week, you're gonna earn your 40 hours in like the end of August, beginning of September timeframe, right? But if you work less than that, then you're not gonna earn it until May, your last few hours until maybe October, November, or you may never earn all 40 in one calendar year. And you can't roll that over, right? So yeah, so actually you can, you can. So you as an employer, that's that actually becomes another discretionary um, uh, question. So yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, that we did miss that. So that you could roll over up to 40 hours, but if you allow employees to roll over 40 hours, you don't have to permit them to accrue any more than 40 hours. So if an employee rolls over 40 hours from 2021 to 2022. In 2022, they're not gonna earn any additional earned paid leave. But if an employee rolls over eight hours from 2021 into 2022, then in 2022, they are earning 32 hours of earned paid leave, plus they have the eight hours that they rolled over for a total of 40 hours. Yeah, so I think that's right. That was a discretionary one we missed. So I'm glad that came up. Um, so the main point I think is that someone can only earn up to 40 in a year and someone can only take up to 40 in a year. It is discretionary for the business owner to decide, do they want to allow the carryover? Great. Um, must you have a written policy in place or is simply abiding when the request of an employee arises along with hanging the poster enough to comply? It's enough to comply, but we don't recommend it just because it, it could, it's likely going to cause confusion and then how the policy itself is implemented each time could vary. So there's nothing requiring a policy is in effect, um, but we do, I do recommend it. And I think Cynthia, this is- It's, a, it's <laughs> very, very good practice. Um, Tani said a couple of times that um, communication really matters here. And there are a couple of ways of communicating with employees, but one way that's super clear is if you write it down, it doesn't have to be a lot of words, but if you're very clear and you post it where they can see it and then you tell them about it. Yes, yes. Okay, w time for one last question, uh, please. Ah, uh, always the toughest part. Um, is know. it permissible under the rules for employers to simply front and front and load the EPL if they would rather not track it by employee and by hours. There is risk there, but it simplifies things for some businesses. Absolutely. Yes, you absolutely can do that. And then the next question becomes, well, what if somebody terminates their employment in February after you front loaded 40 hours in January? Can you attempt to recoup any time that hadn't truly been earned? The answer is yes but you then have to figure out kind of how you are gonna have them earn it anyway. So that becomes more difficult, but the clear answer is yes, you can front load it and it can be based off of calendar year or it can be based off of anniversary year. So front loading is permissible. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, I think this has been one of the meatiest discussions we have ever had. And I'm very grateful that the two of you have such a wealth of experience um,
for our audience, a reminder that we do record these. And so this will be posted on our landing page after the fact. Uh, both Cynthia and Tani said that they will try to answer other kind of general questions if time allows. So if we didn't get to your question, and I see we have at least seven more in the queue, um, I apologize, but if you want to submit your questions anyway, we'll see if we can get them answered for you. Uh, if we were doing this in our customary place in the Portland Public Library, you would be hearing thunderous applause right now. Uh, but for the but, but instead, you just have me saying thank you so much. Um, I think this has been very informative, very helpful, and I really appreciate uh, your time and your expertise uh, sharing that with us today. So. Thank you to our panelists, to our sponsors, to our audience. Uh, stay tuned. In March, we're going to be looking at the issue of internships on making it work. And uh, you'll get more details on that uh, relatively soon. So thank you again, everyone. Good afternoon.